With a break in the weather, the team decide to take the drive to Launceston. Bill is keen to have a look at some of the classic thylacine art on display in the centre of this historic town. So here we are in the city of Launceston and behind me here is beautiful bronze sculpture by the artist Stephen Walker. Now Stephen Walker was a sculptor who only died just recently a few years ago at the age of about 86. Now he has sculptures all over Tasmania, he's got some beautiful penguins and seals down in Hobart. This is one we're interested in because it's a thylacines. Um, Another interesting point about uh, Stephen Walker is that in the 1950s he trained with world famous sculptor Henry Moore. He also received an Order of Australia. What I find interesting here is what looks like a thylacine family. You know, this is mummy, daddy and the kids. Question is, did thylacines have families like this? There's lots of reports of them uh, in a family situation like this and I sort of wonder if are we seeing uh, maybe a male that's grown up the size of mum and the females haven't got there yet or are we seeing a couple of females that are looking after the young together I have seen this with Tasmanian devils where you'll get um, uh, two females and they will share the responsibility of looking after the young I've seen this a couple of times in captivity and I can see it could possibly happen out in the wild, especially since we set up we set up a situation where we had a really big enclosure. We had uh, two females, a male and young, and that's exactly what happened. Two females looked after the young. One guarded the young while the other went and got food, and so it made sense. Unfortunately, because we've not kept thylacines in captivity since the 30s, uh, we just don't know. That's always been the problem so much we don't know about this animal and hopefully one day we will know well time for the next destination the Launceston coat of arms over my right shoulder it really shows you how important the thylacine is to Tasmanian present day you can see by the, the strong musculature of this particular animal that it's here to symbolise protecting the city of Launceston. The chains are speaking to Launceston's convict past. It's just a pity that this kind of iconography is the only thing that's left of the Tasmanian tiger. Looking for additional clues to guide their hunt, the team have received an invite from the curators of the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery. It's an opportunity not to be missed. I'm here with uh, David Maynard. Uh, David, can you just uh, explain what your role here is at the Queen Victoria Museum? I'm the Curator of Natural Sciences, so uh, I'm meant to be able to look after geology, zoology and botany. That's a very wide range of things <laughs> you have to look after. Uh, now, of course, we're here because we're interested in thylacine and uh, I've probably had a few questions about uh, thylacine because you have a great collection here. Um, you've got a lot of stuffed specimens, you've got um, skeletons and things we're looking at. There's a lot of people who are just true believers. What do you think? Do you think thylacines are there or not? Well, I, I'd start by saying that uh, Tasmanians either believe that the thylacine is still existing or they wish it was. I mean, it's such an icon for Tasmania. Myself, I've done enough research to say that it is extinct. Okay. Well, here's the question I always like to ask somebody who says that, that it is extinct, and that is, what date would you put on, if you had to guess, when do you think it became extinct? Was it 1936, 33, or was it a later date? 
Well, we know that the last one died in the Hobart Zoo in 1936, uh, the captive animal. And we know that uh, a guy, Wolf Batty, shot one in 1930s. But they would probably not have been the last ones. I think that they probably were able to hold on into the early 1950s. That's just based on our own research. Okay. So, 1950s. an educated guess with a lack of evidence? Or yeah. was there any circumstantial evidence? No, look, it's just... Uh, Again, based on the research that we've done towards the exhibition and book, our gut feel really is they could have held on that long. A couple of generations. Yep. Good. Um, another question that we don't often hear about uh, is fossil remains of uh, Tasmanian tiger. Uh, not modern ones, but ancient ones. Yep. Uh, more prehistoric ones in actual Tasmania, because I've heard about them all over Australia, but it's very quiet in Tasmania. Uh, can you enlighten us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, uh, there is uh, fossil remains and sub-fossil remains from caves. Uh, even here in the north of Tasmania, we, there was, was a site, uh, Flowery Gully. Uh, we've got some great material from there. Unfortunately, that site is now a quarry, uh, so we can't go back there. That material is not part of our zoology collection. It, it fits in our geology collection. And so it is basically locked away in the bowels of the museum, waiting for a, uh, the right person to come along, a paleontologist or such, to come along and uh, work out its age and, and uh, how, how it might have, where it fitted into the time scale, I guess. Great. So it, it does exist. Th uh, thylacines, we know, lived in Tasmania uh, millions of years ago. Uh, we've got fossil evidence that puts them well, well before uh, European and possibly before the first Tasmanians, the Aboriginals are on. What do you think caused the decline of the species? Well, there are a number of, there's no one thing that knocked the thylacine off. Uh, it was part of a, a family of uh, top order predators dating back 25 million years. The, the dozen or so other species had died out. It's possible that this one was already in decline and Tasmania was its last refuge. We think there might have been two or four thousand animals when the Europeans turned up, we don't know. Uh, and it's likely that between agriculture, uh, where farmers needed to uh, turn grasslands into pasture for sheep, not wallabies, uh, that could have affected the thylacines because they weren't allowed to eat sheep. Uh, and their, their uh, normal food uh, items were uh, not as available. We've been doing research on the Tasmanian Aborigine in the landscape uh, over the last 40,000 years and we know that they burnt the landscape to promote a uh, mosaic effect of green growth that uh, the redneck wallaby or the Bennett's wallaby mm. uh, ate. That was their dominant uh, food source. Uh, the, the Aborigines mostly ate redneck wallaby. We've got cave evidence that shows that 70% of their diet was redneck wallaby. Once uh, the firestick farming was lost because of the Aborigines' uh, demise. It's likely that the redneck wallaby also suffered and it was the paddy melon that benefited. Maybe it's that the thylacine had uh, adapted to hunt redneck wallaby, uh, but now we had this paddy melon with different behaviours, different, different uh, uh, environmental uh, preferences. Maybe the thylacine just didn't have the same food source, the same ability to hunt. Uh, my experience, because I've hand raised both species, mm. is that um, your paddy melon's a tough little bugger. You know, like, it will just stand out and hail, whereas redneck wallabies are soft, they'll go and hide. And so, you know, it'd be really, it's a really interesting thing to follow, follow up on, I mm. think. Uh, I really quite like this theory. Well, again, I only know fish, so you've got a bit of homework to do. Let me know how you go. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just uh, now just, yeah, because like <laughs> I said, I have actually hand-raised both species, had a lot to do with those species. The only thing missing is you haven't hand-raised the thylacine. I know. I keep thinking if I just knock that mum off, I can <laughs> go and hand-raise them. And... Okay, so we normally have a skeptometer here. Yep. Uh, zero meaning you don't believe her there, they're completely extinct. Uh, Ten meaning you're a true believer. Now, it's very hard to be a true believer unless you saw one, you know, that was very juvenile a couple of weeks ago. Uh, even if you saw one 10 years ago, it could be dead now. Uh, likewise, you can't really be a complete uh, zero because you can't really know that they're all gone. 
in the same way that you don't know that there's fairies at the bottom of the garden. They could be there, you know, or they could be unicorns, who knows? Hanging out with the So, uh, if you're really skeptical, you'd be a zero, zero point one or point whatever. Okay. Uh, so, on a scale of uh, zero to ten, where are you on the skepometer? Can I justify myself? Yeah. Of uh, there's research being done on roadkill in Tasmania each year, around 293,000 animals a di die each year. Not one of them has been a thylacine in the past X amount of years. I am a skeptic. I am a 0 0.001. I just can't believe that by now, with all of these people looking for them, we haven't found one. I guess especially the way Tasmanians drive. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess I, I would have to wonder if I saw one on the road. Do I take a photo or do I collect it? <laughs> so, David, what makes the Queen Victoria Museum collection special? Well, this, this exhibition uh, represents uh, the very little collection that we have, which is representative of the global collection. We have very precious remains of the thylacine, and that's our title, very uh, precious little remains. Here we've tried to mix both the biology of the animal, biology, ecology, and uh, its demise with uh, the ongoing searches for the species and some of the evidence that's uh, provided by the public uh, as to its ongoing existence. And we've also mixed it with things like this here where we've got some of the history of both the species and in the community. We've really tried to capture that, that uh, community angle because as I've said earlier, Tasmanians either believe they still exist or wish they had. So we've got uh, audio tracks, we've got um, written oral histories of the species. We've also got a lot of interactive, so kids can come in and, and touch a thylacine uh, or a thylacine skin. And we've even gone to the uh, trouble of coming up with a 3D animation of a skull, which you can really look into. Get in, you can go into the teeth and, and, and the suture lines and such. So you can, yeah. so we've, got a, we've got a bit of tech, we've got a lot of history, and we've got a fair amount of our collection on display. So David, uh, being a place where the public can come in, do you get people from the public coming in with um, stories, with say evidence that they've collected to say that fire scenes are still out there? We certainly do and it's cyclical. Uh, just uh, for instance after this uh, area we will get people coming in with either uh, some skulls of uh, different animals, but not thylacine. Uh, droppings, footprint casts, uh, video and photos. Uh, but uh, we, although we do try to um, like show the community, show those people what those things are, they don't always believe us. Uh, what we really want are either good oral histories of people that may have have first-hand knowledge of the animal, as in uh, Kerrison or Harrison mm -hmm. or whoever that, that have ha handled them, uh, or we want a thylacine, a living, breathing one. Okay, so some of the evidence that come in, like casts and things like that, are they obviously dog or are they inconclusive? Um, Generally, our, our zoology staff can identify what the the cast is, right. and it comes down to four or five animals normally, mm -hmm. uh, and not one of them is irrefutable. We, we cannot guarantee that any of the evidence, whether it be casts or uh, droppings or photos, we cannot guarantee that it is a thylacine. The only proof will be deliver a live one to the front door, okay. please. Yeah, okay, well, we'll <laughs> do our best. <laughs> so Dave, what can you tell me about this part of the exhibition? It's fascinating. Well, uh, one of the themes is the continuing searches and although the last thylacine died in 1936 in captivity, that was just eight weeks after it had been protected. So the government was then obliged to start to search for the animal and they started searching in the early days down in the southwest of Tasmania. But we now know that that was not preferred habitat of the species. And in the, it wasn't until the 70s when some people thought, let's ask the community about the, the sightings. And so uh, Mally, Bob Brown and Jeremy Griffiths uh, set up basically in the mall and asked people for their information and this map represents where sightings are recorded and so if in the early days these guys here had gone up to the northeast perhaps 
a thylacine might have been found and then some protective measures could have been put in place. Right. And so we also have some interesting casts and well, things like that. Yeah, of course, uh, part of the whole story is the ongoing sightings of this animal. So we get a lot of material here, for instance, uh, casts of different animals' footprints in mud. They're not irrefutable. It makes it very hard. It, you know, mud mud uh, can be quite sloppy. Things yeah. can move. Or, um, and we get things like dog skulls. We've got sheep skulls with uh, bullet holes in them. Uh, and we get a lot of droppings coming in. Uh, How do they get a sheep skull? Oh, I, see, I see the bullet holes. They think they're fangs. Possibly, yeah. From thylacine, yeah, yeah okay. But, uh, yeah, I mean, people uh, don't do enough homework to, yeah. to look at the basic uh, anatomy of the animal. And the nose being chewed off that thing, that's typical Tasmanian devil there you go. behavior. <laughs> but not that. thylacine, or not that we know. Well, not that we know, we don't know thylacine, but yeah, it's very, most likely devil. Yeah. <laughs> Ockham's razor would say that. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go so, very. So what we're looking for in the continuing search, if, you, if you're going to bring something to the museum, it has to be irrefutable. And unfortunately, a lot of the evidence, we can, we can um, dispute its veracity or its provenance or accuracy. Okay. The only thing that, for me as curator, if I want to move on in thylacine research, I need a live one delivered to the front door. All right, what about if somebody got something that was highly probable that I'd say paw print that was so clear that's the most, most likely thylacine then rather than anything else. We rely as a museum, we rely on proof in present presentation. Okay. And so we would have to um, take your information on face value. Yeah. But really can can we be sure that whoever's presented it hasn't fabricated it? or it's been passed on through generations and it came from a different location or blah blah. We, yeah, we really so, yeah. struggle. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the things we say, say too, unless we actually took the cast ourselves, That's we right. wouldn't know. Yeah. So David, I believe there is a good publication that you guys have produced about the Tasmanian Tiger. That's right, we've got uh, our book, Tasmanian Tiger, Precious Little Remains. Uh, it's the museum's uh, research into the species. It brings together the animal's biology and its demise. Uh, the continuing hunt for the animal uh, and some of the folklore and mystery around the species. So uh, if you want to know our version of the facts, this is it. So what, what a great exhibition. I think that anybody who is any way interested in natural history and in particular the thylacine, this is the place to come to have a look at, at the exhibition that they've got here. It's great. I think the, the book that they've put together stands out in terms of the amount of thought and research that they've put into getting that product. So fact-based, albeit the fact that there aren't a lot of facts about thylacine to start with, and I think that just the name of the exhibition, Precious Little Remains, shows you that there isn't uh, a wealth of information about the thylacine. The other thing that uh, I really liked about this exhibition is the fact that it has that link between the past and the future the contemporary searches. And I think that the map that uh, we've had a look at today provides a great guide for us to get out into the field and to contextualise the good work that's being done at Queen Victoria Museum. Great, let's get out let's there. Let's get out there.